Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So, as we get into the 14th and 15th centuries, as many of you will know in Europe, um, plate armour started to really come into its own. Um, and so we enter really the age of plate. And it was obviously originally it was a supplement to male armour, commonly known as chainmail, of course. Um, and in its uh, kind of in its time in the 15th century, um, it really kind of took over, at least for knights um, or men at arms, um, plate armour kind of took over from male armour to a large degree. Mail never disappeared. Mail was still used by many types of soldiers and indeed by knights in certain parts of the body where there wasn't plate or you couldn't put plate, you know, armpits and groin and things like this. Um, so mail never disappeared, but plate became more prevalent. And as a result, the weapons evolved, as I'm sure most of you know, the weapons evolved. Um, and it's a kind of, it's a, it's a balance. It's not only that weapons evolved to overcome the armour, but it's also the fact that the armour that came in uh, enabled you to use certain types of weapons. For example, you didn't necessarily, if you were fully uh, plated man-at-arms or um, knight, you didn't necessarily need to use a shield in most circumstances anymore, even in some cases on horseback. So even in jousting, for example, we see that shields to a certain degree become almost I won't say ornamental, but they become far less important than they had been. And so they actually become things which are attached to the uh, to the armor and become almost like a target in the joust, for example. But in warfare, it became increasingly common for fully armored um, soldiers, so knights, men at arms, to just do away with the shield. Now, if you no longer have to carry and use a shield, obviously that makes certain weapons uh, preferable to use because now both hands are available, but not only is it, as I say, it's a, it's a double thing. Not only is it that the shield uh, isn't being used, so therefore you may as well use two hands on your weapon, but additionally, because you're trying to overcome the opponent's armor, if you're fighting people in similar equipment to yourselves, um, then you start to use the weapon in new ways. For example, half swording, as commonly known uh, with the long sword, for example. And you start to use the weapon in new ways to try and overcome your armoured opponents or people who are wearing a similar amount of equipment to you, um, whereby thrusting into gaps and wrestling and these kinds of things become more important than just striking with the sword was previously, because just striking onto someone's plate armour, even if it's something like a gambeson, uh, sorry, if, if it's something like a brigandine over a gambeson or perhaps brigandine over mail over um, an arming doublet, then um, it's going to have minimal effect just trying to chop through that kind of armour. It's not really going to, it's going to have a percussive effect, but fairly minimal at that. So we start to see, obviously, uh, most of you know, you start to see weapons start to come in in this period, either to, for greater penetration, which we love on this channel, or for greater percussive effect, and sometimes for both. And that's where I'm going to put the longsword down, because this isn't a longsword video, as you see from the title. This is actually a poleaxe video. Now, before I go on, I will say, if you are interested in poleaxes, I actually have um, some, I, I'm going to list three below, three good videos on the subject of the Polax um, that I've actually done with um, Tobias, Dr. Tobias Kappel at the Wallace Collection. Now, if you really want to go deep into this subject, then by all means go and look at those videos. You may have seen them already. You might like to watch them again. There are, um, I think they're, a couple of them are a couple of years old and one of them is about four years old now. Um, so it might be worth going back and having a look at those. We cover some really great um, material and go really, really deep into the subject. But given that I have a Polax here at the moment, this isn't actually mine. This is um, one that I picked up uh, recently when I was picking some other stuff up uh, for a friend of mine, uh, known to many of you as Gavin. So shout out to Gavin uh, from my club. And this is going to Gavin. And this was made by Whitewell Arms. OK, and you can find Whitewell Arms uh, by Googling them, or you can find them on Facebook. They've got a Facebook page where they um, show uh, what they're currently working on and things that they've just sold and things like this. And uh, this came from Whitewell Arms, I believe, about a year ago. And then the person who ordered it had subsequently decided to sell it, along with some other things, some of which I bought off them. Hence, I was uh, picking those things up. And um, so first up, Whitewell Arms are quite well known for making poleaxes. If you want to buy a poleaxe, Whitewell Arms are one of your kind of go-to makers. I will, before I go on and talk generally about poleaxes, just say something about um, replica poleaxes in general. Um, so poleaxes are something which are often carried in reenactment, 
uh, and uh, even like the kind of uh, Battle of the Nations type stuff. But they're not commonly used in this format because they are so freaking dangerous and it's very difficult. You can make, this is actually a sharp one, but you can, you can make um, a blunted point, you can make a blunted hammer, you can make a blunted ax edge. If you've got a beck or beak, uh, you can make that blunted, but nevertheless, you can't really wail on someone in a reenactment context with any amount of force uh, very safely. Um, you can you can tap them and jab them fairly softly at best. If they're wearing a very comprehensive plate armor with a fair amount of padding underneath, you might be able to donk them. Uh, but if you look at um, Battle of the Nations videos where people sometimes, they don't use ones like this because I think they'd be illegal, well they would be illegal for Battle of the Nations, but they do use earlier forms of large axe uh, with very blunt, obviously very blunt blades. Um, and you will see sometimes people using very long handled ones, almost more like a Dane axe, where they do catch someone with a full blow and sometimes just lay someone out. This is a, an incredibly powerful weapon. And um, it is a weapon, obviously, that came into its own, particularly in the 15th century. Now that's not to say that it didn't exist beforehand. Uh, so first thing I'll say before I go into talking about the um, Polax in general is that they do actually appear, not exactly like this, this is a very 15th century form, but they do appear with the basic format of an axe, a hammer and a spike um, in the 13th century. Um, and if you look at 13th century manuscript uh, illuminations, you can see weapons that look, you basically, you would call it a poleaxe. Not really a halberd, you'd call it a poleaxe. So they do kind of start to appear in this, with those three important elements in the 13th century, but they don't become popular until the 14th century. And I would assert that that's largely because of um, plate armor and therefore people think, well, what are we gonna do? All this new armor, my, you know, my one-handed arming sword or my long sword is not a particularly effective weapon anymore. They look around at what weapons are available and they go, that'll work. Um, and so I don't think it was necessarily a newly invented weapon, but it was a weapon that they went, that will work for our needs given the new context of, uh, of the armor that's, that's being used. But as mentioned, this particular style is very much a kind of Gothic 15th century iconic style. Um, you find similar examples, original examples to this in the Royal Armouries, in, um, in the Wallace collection, various other famous um, collections of arms and armour in the world. I think the Metropolitan Museum of Art's got one or two. Um, but before I go on talking about pole axes for a second, I'm going to just talk a little bit about replica pole axes. So number one, they can't usually, within most reenactment contexts, be used fully how you would actually use a pole axe because they're too dangerous. Um, as I've mentioned in previous videos, you can use a blunted sword pretty safely, um, so long as it's blunt, uh, with some care, and you can apply quite a lot of force with the sword because they're not percussive weapons. They're cutting weapons so, and, and thrusting weapons. So if you take away their ability to cut and thrust by making them blunt, then actually they become relatively safe to hit people, at least if they've got a fair amount of protection on, to hit people with. So it's actually fairly easy to make sword fighting safe. It is very difficult to make any form of pole arm fighting, pole axe, bill, um, halberd, whatever, into a safe form of sparring or competitive fighting without having a huge amount of um, armor on. Because quite simply, these weapons were designed with the force of the hit alone to overcome that armor. Now, just to refer to a period source, um, Fiore Delibery, he actually has a technique which is, I, I, I am reluctant to describe as a technique where you literally just hit the person in the head hard, in the helmet. And yet, yeah, helmets prevent um, blows from swords really, really well. Um, but if you hit someone really, really hard with a two-handed weapon like a poleaxe, smack in the head, uh, with either side, with the axe or the, or the hammer, then even if you don't penetrate the metal, and you might do, we do have wounds, um, battlefield wounds from the 15th, 16th centuries with square holes in the head that have clearly had some spike like that through, potentially through the helmet and through the skull. Um, even if it doesn't penetrate the helmet, just the force alone is gonna, whoa, you know, it's gonna clock you. Uh, it'd be like being punched really, really hard in the head. Um, so it might knock you over, might knock you out, might just daze you, 
um, potentially it could kill you. It could be, uh, you know, there could be a brain injury, there could be a neck injury, and so on. So they're very, very powerful weapons. So, um, so the ones made for reenactment are uh, often, you know, beautifully uh, historically accurate like this, but they have limited use for the most part in most reenactment fighting, unfortunately. Although you can obviously use them uh, more gently uh, to, you know, for a show, show kind of purposes or to, to give a general impression of a battlefield um, usage. But in terms of the replicas, there aren't actually that many people around making good quality replica poleaxes. You know, there's Whitewell Arms, there's Arms and Armour, there's uh, Fabrice Cogno, there's various people out there who are making them. Uh, but a lot, not that many people are buying them and they're quite expensive things to make. As much work, possibly even more work, goes into making one of these as making one of these. And that's something you have to note about these poleaxes is they are high status pole arms. Unlike a typical bill or halberd, which is made for a, um, you know, a normal class, a kind of uh, lower to middle class soldier, these are knightly weapons and they are elaborate. They have an elaborate construction and they often have elaborate detailing. So if we just have a little look at this one, you will see that um, you often have perforations in the blade, which reduce the weight of the weapon, of course, but they also increase its decorative quality and its kind of almost architectural gothic qualities. You have these little scoops and stuff, which yes, again, might have practical uses. They could uh, enable, you know, trapping and, and hooking, but they are also architectural and they do have a aesthetic quality. But you have added decoration, which doesn't need to be there. But of course, because this is a very high status weapon, it gets added on because the person is paying a lot of money for this and they want it to look fancy. This, as much of the sword as the sword, is a status object that says, I am a knight, I am a gentleman, this is a gentleman's weapon. This is not a commoner's weapon. Even little details how you have these um, sort of filed out bevels on the side of the top spike, or dag as it's called in French, um, same word as dagger. Um, and you know, that doesn't need to be there, but it increases the almost architectural beauty of the object. Um, in terms of functionality, you often find that the um, the blades of the axes, if they have an axe, that sometimes you just have a hammer and a beak, sometimes you have an axe and a hammer, and sometimes you have an axe and a beak. So those are the three basic combinations. You pretty much always have a top spike of some kind. Sometimes the blade is curved um, with a crescent shape, sometimes it's straight, sometimes it's straight and tilted, and sometimes it's just very slightly curved like this. Um, in terms of the hammer side, sometimes the hammer is flat, sometimes it has pyramidal projections on it, which help bite into the armour or clothing or whatever you're hitting. Sometimes you have a projecting beak coming out of the hammer, so this is almost a combination of the beak and the hammer. Why do you have these two faces? Well, generally speaking, I would say that this is supposed to be sharp and this is the thing for hitting armour. Something I spoke about in a recent Patreon video, for anyone who doesn't know I do have extra videos on Patreon. If um, you want to pay uh, uh, $3 a month then you get extra uh, videos from me. Um, and one of the things I said is something we often overlook with sharp weapons when we kind of dispel the myth that medieval weapons were blunt bludgeoning weapons when they were actually finely edged and sharp. But something we sometimes overlook in stating that is that when you're striking pieces of armour, then um, your sharp weapon is not necessarily going to stay sharp for very long. If your opponents are armoured and you're striking them with your beautifully honed longsword, your beautifully honed longsword, if you're striking armour, is not going to stay beautifully honed for very long. Um, with the poleaxe, you do have the potential option to reserve your edge, your sharp edge, for carving up less armoured opponents, um, so the common infantry you might come up against, and reserve the hammer side for striking fully armoured um, opponents. That's one potential um, reason for those two different uh, faces. The other one could be simply that um, you want one, you could actually use that one for striking, it's not going to get stuck in anything, whereas the side, if you've got a beak or, or a projecting spike, that might get stuck in armour, um, so you might penetrate the armour, but you might get stuck in it. So there's different benefits and different pluses and minuses to both of those sorts of end. And one thing I should mention as well is we have another end, a back end. This one is blunt, 
Oh, well, it's got a pyramidal projection. Um, and this is called the Q. If we look at Le Jus de la Hache, for example, the Burgundian Polacks treatise of the 15th, late 15th century. Um, and these are all used. Okay, The commonly used parts of the Polacks are the dag, so the top spike, the hash or the hammer, whichever is, or the beak or the hammer on the other side, so striking with either side, and also the cue, uh, much like a pommel, incidentally. That is used very similar to how a pommel is sometimes used with a longsword. Um, and the bit that often gets overlooked, the middle of the shaft is often used as well to push away when an opponent comes close. Uh, so you might predominantly be fighting with the top end. If they come close, you might push them away. You might use the butt end. Sometimes, if we look at um, the Anonimo Bolognese sauce, for example, you'll actually lead with the cute end, or with the back end, and keep the head back, ready to strike when the opportunity presents itself. And you might parry and defend with the shaft and the back end, because it's actually more nimble. So if you look at it, the point of balance is there. So that's the heavy end. So actually, you might actually keep the lighter, less offensive end in front of you to do things with, to defend with, and then keep that back end for striking. And remember, you can slip the hands, okay? So you can move your hands closer to either end as required and needed, okay? So you can get extra reach when you need it. So before I finish off, there are just three other things I want to say about pole axes, which I may or may not have mentioned in previous videos to varying degrees. First of all, a lot of people go, uh, what's the difference between a pole axe and a halberd? And it's a very good question because halberds have some similar features. They usually have a hook or beak on the back, they have an axe blade on the front and they have a top spike. The basic differences between uh, pole axes, in my view, different people have different definitions, but the basic difference is one of length and one of construction. Okay, So the first thing is that, generally speaking, halberds are longer than this. A pole axe, so that's on the ground, a pole axe is usually between about four feet long and about six feet long, not usually much more than that. Halberds are usually for infantrymen with less armour and therefore are longer weapons and they're used in groups. So whilst this is an individual melee weapon, the halberd, generally speaking, is a weapon intended to be used by infantry en masse. So they're usually longer, they usually um, don't have anything on the back end, they're usually just a shaft at the back end, and they're usually used in groups with the head forward. Um, that's the, f that's the first thing. The second thing is a construction. So a halberd head is usually all forge welded into one piece. So usually the beak, the axe, the spike, and the langettes, when I'll talk about langettes in a minute, the langettes that come down the sides and sometimes the front and back, are usually all one forge welded piece that just goes onto a shaft and is then riveted through. The pole axe is actually made of different elements. Um, now that's not to say all pole axes are made the same, and that's one point that I would say so some people who know about pole axes say that, oh, they're always made like this in these constituent parts, but actually not all pole axes are made the same. Pole axes do vary. Uh, but this type of pole axe um, in particular is made of different elements where the head, that, so this bit through the middle with the axe and the hammer is one piece that goes onto a sort of lug uh, that comes up the middle and is often attached to these langettes. And then the bit which is the uh, top spike or the dag and the side langettes that come down there with a bolt through with these spikes is a separate piece. So they're kind of like three pieces that jigsaw together. And these spikes on the side, incidentally, are basically a, a um, nut and bolt that go through the construction and hold the head together uh, with the top um, mounting over the top. And they literally screw uh, together. Um, and the ends in this case have been made into spikes. They don't have to be made into spikes, but they kind of look cool. And I, I guess potentially if you got your edge alignment wrong, you'd whack someone with the side spike. Um, or if you missed your target, maybe you could come back and clunk them in the side of the face with the spike or something. I don't think the spikes, I've never seen a treatise which actually mentions the use of these spikes. So I don't think they're terribly important, but they look cool and they make the weapon even more uh, aggressive and offensive. Um, and the third thing uh, I wanted to mention is about langettes. Uh, so these langettes are actually a very important feature which are to be found on most, I won't say all, but nearly all pole axes. So anything which is a pole axe will usually have quite noticeable langettes. Now what are those langettes there for? 
Well, obviously they're partially there to protect the shaft from uh, people hacking away with other bladed weapons. Um, but I actually think that their use is almost more important than that. And I have seen some replica pole axes, which weren't as well made as this, where the langets weren't attached to the shaft in the correct way or weren't supporting the shaft in the correct way, where the shaft snapped. And a pole axe often tends in use, when you're whacking things really hard with it, to snap around here. Um, I suppose that's, I don't know why, there's some kind of physics reason, I guess, for why they tend to break up here somewhere. But having the langets there makes the weapon immeasurably, not immeasurably, but makes it much stronger. Um, and also helps secure the head to the shaft and um, more or less gets rid of the risk of any break happening around here, which results in your polax, your very nicely made and effective polax head, flying off over there somewhere and you being left with just a wooden handle to hit people with. Um, so it secures all of this offensiveness to your uh, shaft and make sure that you're less likely to lose your head, so to speak. Um, and potentially, as a sort of byproduct, by essentially iron cladding this part of the shaft, if you miss the person you're swinging at with the head, and you have to bear in mind that is one advantage of swords, that you hit, it, hit someone with any part of that uh, lever and you're going to do some damage to them, at least with this, if you miss them with the head that you're aiming to hit them with and you hit them with that, you're still going to be hitting them with what's essentially a, an iron-bound stick, which is like a mace or a heavy quarter staff. Um, so it does make the head more effective. Now, um, uh, one thing I would say um, is replica poleaxes, in my experience, tend to get two things I won't say wrong, and I don't want to come across as too critical, because this is a nice replica. But I think that this could be a re better replica by virtue of changing two things. Now, as you'll know from the other videos where I've filmed at the Wallace Collection uh, with Dr. Capwell, and I've been at other collections where I've handled original poleaxes as well, and I've seen them even for sale um, and handled those, the langets on reenactment poleaxes, in my opinion, number one, tend to be too thick and heavy. And number two, tend to be, like this one, um, laid onto the surface of the shaft. I'll just bring that closer so you can see. You will see that the langets, the nice thick bands of steel, are riveted to the surface of the wooden shaft. Now, if we look at period ones, I won't say always, because I haven't studied every pole axe that still survives, but generally speaking, these langets are recessed into the wood. So the wood is literally cut out and the langet sits into the surface of the wood. In other words, so that this shaft is flush all the way up. The problem when they sit proud of the surface like this is one of the very important uh, factors of using a pole axe is that you want to be able to slide your hand up and down, okay? And the problem with them sitting proud is it's gonna stop your hands being able to easily slide up and down that shaft. And sometimes in period manuscript illustrations of these being used, we even see them being gripped this far up the shaft, you know? And we know from the uh, treatises that sometimes they're held with the cue extended well out here, and then in action you might do a defensive, you know, a parry, and then slip the hand down here and strike with that much out in front of the hand. And just having those langets proud of the surface, especially when you've got the rivets through them as well, it can make it unpleasant to do, and in fact sometimes difficult and almost impossible to do, uh, with, with maintaining a good grip on the weapon. That's the first thing. And the second thing I mentioned is that the langets tend to be, in my opinion, on replicas, they tend to be made of too thick steel which makes them overweight and too heavy. Incidentally, this weapon is not especially heavy. It's about six and a half pounds, uh, which for a pole arm is not terribly heavy, especially considering the amount of metal on this. Um, although you have to remember, of course, I showed you the point of balance. The point of balance is there, okay? So for a weapon of about five feet long, it's, uh, it's about two feet from one end. So it's, it's, it's not that far from the middle, but it's fairly far from the middle. And when you're swinging something from this end, if you're hitting someone from fairly far away, even if you hold it a bit further up, it does feel a little bit unwieldy. I think that that could be improved simply by making the langets about half the thickness of what they currently are. Um, and it'd be nice if they were recessed. So there we go. It's not a full review. It's not f really fair of me to review something that isn't mine, but um, I, I would say that that isn't specific to this one. That is a general criticism of most replicas of most uh, modern made poleaxes. Anyway, I'm going to finish up there. The poleaxe is an awesome weapon. 
uh, obviously really came into its own in the 15th century, was still in use in the 16th century, was used in tournaments, was used in war. This absolutely would have been considered a primary weapon for a knight in the 15th century. Whereas this, generally speaking, despite Hollywood and, and The Witcher and everything else, um, this, generally speaking, would be a secondary or backup weapon. So generally a person using a pole axe would have a, also a sword and a dagger. And those would be a very typical three weapon set for a knight of the 15th century or indeed the late 14th century. And hence, when we look at uh, combat treatises like Fury or Vardy or um, Talhofer or Cal or whatever, um, we often see that the three weapons of knightly combat are the poleaxe, the longsword, the dagger, and wrestling as well, which obviously combines with all three of those weapons. Um, anyway, there we go, the 15th century knightly poleaxe. Do please go and check out those other videos if you haven't seen them before, or if you haven't seen them for a long time, go and have a look at them again, because I think actually some of the videos I've done with Toby Catpole are probably some of my best work, and I'm looking forward to doing more uh, with him in 2020, when time allows. And um, yeah, give us a subscribe, share the video, give us a like, check that the notification bell is clicked on, and I'll see you guys really soon for another video. And yes, you will get to see my new armor fairly soon. Cheers, folks. Was used in tournaments, was used in war. This would have been considered a... a <laughs> Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.